Hey everybody, how's it going today? I am Howard Jacobson and this is Triangle Be Well, the local show that uh, talks about health, wellness, and actually since it's on the internet, it's local where you are too. I was once at a supermarket and I saw a sign that said local produce from around the world. And I actually had to think twice before realizing that that was silly. Everything's local. So um, joined in the studio by uh, producer and co-producer Amnon and Nathan. How you guys doing? We're doing Hi, great. You? Thank you. Awesome. Welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, I was, uh, I was away for a little while. I, was, I don't remember what I was doing, but apparently I have a tan. So <laughs> I hope it was fun. You do. <laughs> well, I was, I, was, uh, I was traveling, and so I wasn't able always to get up at uh, crack of dawn and run, so I was running in some sunshine. So I guess... Uh, my head obligingly photosynthesized a little bit. Um, been doing a lot of running lately. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I'm, I'm, I'm in training for a 50K thanks to a, a blurt that I had during a conversation with Josh Lajani, with whom I'm working on a book. And, uh, you know, it's kind of all about him and his story, and I'm just helping to kind of narrate it and put it in perspective. And then some part of me said, what if I was part of the story, too? And I was like, hey, why don't I do a 50K? And once I say something like that, I kind of have a, uh, a bit of pride going. So I've actually been training for a 50K. Josh sent me a training plan that now includes about 63 miles a week. So uh, there's not a day goes by where I don't wonder about my big mouth. But uh, when I'm not running, I feel great. Mondays are my days off. It's now Monday, uh, July 18th. And I love Mondays. So uh, if, you, if you hate Mondays, my advice is to do something hard and uncomfortable and a little bit unpleasant on all the other days. And then your Mondays will become uh, moments of joy and delight. So um, I got b a bunch of stuff to talk about today. But, and I'd love to take your questions. If you have questions about habits, about health, about how to get well, about setbacks, about navigating social situations, about working with family members, about dealing with travel or work or any of that stuff. You know, I've been traveling for a while, so I had to uh, improvise a whole bunch of routines that are just so easy at home. But uh, on the road, they take a little bit of forethought, and sometimes I didn't have the forethought, and I had to improvise, and sometimes I had to give things up and deal with that as well. So if you have any sort of questions about how to be well in this modern world, uh, throw them our way. You can call 919-518-9773, or you can Skype Computers 2K Voice. That's Computers 2K, letter K, Voice on Skype. I think Skype doesn't care uh, if it's uppercase or lowercase. So um, the K can be any size you want it to be. And again, 919-518-9773. Call up, and we'll have a chat. But today, until the phone starts ringing or the Skype starts ringing, I want to talk about stories. And specifically, I want to talk about stories from the point of view of a writer. Because <clears throat> we're, we're all storytellers, right? Humans are basically storytellers. And we grow up hearing stories. When my kids were little, all they wanted at night was, you know, a bedtime story, tell me another story, tell me a story about when you were a little kid, um, tell me a folk tale, tell me a fable, tell me a fairy tale, tell me about what grandpa did. We're kind of story addicts. We love stories. And we get so many stories in our culture that we all of us are instinctively um, experts at how stories work. And because of this, we live our lives according to stories. We live our lives based on stories that we didn't necessarily choose, but that we believe about ourselves. So if someone has a story of, I'm going to, you know, do a rags to riches, I, I, I had a lot of things to overcome, but now I'm, you know, on my way and I'm going to be highly successful. If someone has that story and that's their driving story, then the actions they take 
will be consistent with fulfilling that story. If someone else has a story of, well, I'm just unlucky, um, I work really hard, but things never work out, then that's the story that they are going to actively work to manifest. They'll find ways to be unlucky. They'll find ways to to not have to take responsibility for for where they are in life. So most of us, we, we are consumers of story uh, in, in our everyday lives, and we are subconscious creators of story in our lives. And we also create stories about other people, right? And, and uh, you know, we call these, uh, these stories about other people expectations, um, blind spots, prejudices. So if I have a story about you that you're inconsiderate, then I will filter every interaction I have with you and everything I know about you so that the, the, the moments when I perceive you as incons inconsiderate are first and foremost. So you could be on time, we're carpooling together, you could be on time 99 times in a row, but then you're late once and you don't call and I'm going, oh, inconsiderate. And that's what gets reinforced. The story becomes the framework through which we filter the facts and we filter the interpretations. So that's, that's a basic introduction to story. But as I said, I want to talk about story not as consumers, but as creators of story, as writers. So I don't care if you've never written anything in your life. I don't care if you don't consider yourself to be a writer. Today, you're a writer. And so if we want to create, so if I'm talking to you as a writer and you're like looking for advice on how do I write a good story, <clears throat> we're, we're going to look at a couple of resources to help us write a good story. Not because I want you to become the next Stephen King or James Patterson or Ann Tyler, um, but because the skills that storytellers use to, to create compelling stories out of whole cloth, out of fiction, out of fantasy, out of their own minds, out of historical situations, out of the news, stories that really work. And the stories that really work are the ones where, where we're like turning the page. We can't wait to find out what happens next. We're on a roller coaster. We're invested emotionally in that story. And we really care what happens at the end. And if there's a cliffhanger, if, we, if, if, if the story is interrupted in the middle of a chapter or the middle of a TV show episode, then we're like on the edge of our seats. And we go to forums you know, for Game of Thrones or Orange is the New Black, and we discuss it with other people. And we, we try to figure out how Sherlock faked his death at the end of season two and all this stuff. And we're, we're re that's a story that works when people who encounter that story get really interested in it and, and almost get confused about whose story it is, whether it's a, a, you know, a fictional character being played by actors or whether, in fact, it's something that's happening to them. So I want to talk to you as if you were a writer trying to write one of those stories. However, instead of writing it about, you know, British super agents saving the world from communist plots or um, amnesiac American Delta Force professionals, um, you know, like a, a Born or a Bond or something like that, you're going to write the story of your own life and you're going to make it as compelling and interesting and exciting as any of those writers, as Ian Fleming or Robert Ludlum or Dean Coons or James Patterson or any of those storytellers who can tell a, a yarn that we just have to turn the pages on. So writing a story like that is not different from writing your real life. And as I said, stories tell us, the stories we believe about ourselves will determine, what they tell us who we are, they tell us what we do, and when you change your story, you change your destiny. And the way we change our story is by being a writer, by using what writers use. Now, I want to caution before we jump in that I'm not talking about, well, I am talking about two things. I'm talking about a wholesale shift in your definition. So if your story is, 
I'm not going to account amount to much. I'm just sort of going to go along and count the days till retirement, and I'm going to med- self medicate my sadness with alcohol and and food, and I'm going to sit on the couch and watch, uh, you know, the ESPN Channel Four minor league draft, and I'm just going to, you know, live this life and and just distract myself however I can till it's over. That's a story. We want to give it. We want to swap that out for a much different story, a much more compelling story. The end of that story is going to be very different. But we're not talking about suddenly taking a character and putting them in a whole new story. We're not taking James Bond and putting him in Wonderland with Alice, and and may, and putting a tutu on him and having him you know smoke a hookah pipe. The character is going to be the same character. So we're not talking about writing a story in which you are somebody totally different from who you are. Who you are right now is where you are in the story. We're changing the trajectory and the ending. We're not asking you to, as my friend Peter Bregman says, climb five rungs of the ladder at once. You're, only, you're still going to climb it one at a time. It still has to be believable from where you are. So yeah, we're changing the story, but we're not straining credibility. We're not all of a sudden changing the character. We're just going to change the trajectory and the outcome. Uh, so this tool, the main tool I want to talk about when we're talking about changing our story, and it could be about anything. It could be about career. It could be about relationships. In this context, I think we're mostly going to talk about health and wellness, about changing your health and wellness destiny. Because you know what? It's, it's the foundation of everything else. So if you want to be a successful entrepreneur and you're not, and you're also not healthy, and you're not living in a way that would make you healthy, then <clears throat> getting well is, is kind of the foundational step to changing that, that entrepreneurship part of you. It's more foundational. It's, it's closer to who we are. It's closer to our biology. So it's a great place to start. So whatever the change that you'd like to make, whatever the transformation, whatever the happy ending, the Hollywood ending you're looking for in your life, Looking at health and wellness is a, a great foundation. So the tool we're going to use, it's called the Story Grid, and it was created by a very, very successful, longtime book editor named Sean Coyne, who's, who's represented and helped a lot, a lot of people whose names you know put uh, items on the bestseller list by looking at their stories, and he created this thing called the Story Grid, which is a way of kind of mathematically and sort of paint by numbers evaluating a story and looking at where it works, where it falls down. And I think, and I've, I've been working on it. I've been reading this book and listening to the Story Grid podcast, which is him and uh, Tim Grawl talking about how to create a story and how writers and editors approach the editing process and the creative process. And it occurred to me as I was going through that, which I'm doing because I want to make the book that I'm writing with Josh Lajani as compelling as possible, that it can apply not just to writing, but as we've said, to, to living our life. So the story grid essentially is a formula for the creation of a successful narrative. And if you want to get the things you want, if you want to envision a totally different, wonderful future for yourself, then the most important tool in your arsenal is a compelling narrative where you can read the story in your head of how you got there. And once it's in there and once it's believable and once you start acting like that hero needs to act, then it has a force and almost an inevitability to it. So I'm not going to give you the whole story grid. First of all, you can get the whole thing at storygrid.com. Uh, Sean is a very prolific writer about writing, and there's pretty much nothing that you can't find there on his website. Some things, some of the resources you'd have to sign in, give him your name um, to get. You know, there's PDF downloads, but everything you could possibly want to know about Sean's StoryGrid method is on StoryGrid.com. There's also this podcast that I mentioned, uh, StoryGrid podcast, which you can find through any uh, podcast aggregator or reader. And there's also the book, 
that he wrote called Story Grid or The Story Grid. And this, it's the book and the podcast that I've been uh, drawing upon for my own edification and inspiration. So I'm not going to give you all of it. In fact, I'm going to give you very little of it, almost none. But I'll give you two uh, of the building blocks and then kind of look at those in terms of how we can create health destinations, health arcs, health trajectories based on this, inf this information. So here's the formula. It's really, really simple. There's three parts to a story. There's the setup, the middle build, and the payoff. Another way to say it is there is the beginning, the middle, and the end. And that's pretty obvious, that every story has to start somewhere, it has to end somewhere else, and there has to be a bit in the middle. But it's when we look at <clears throat> these, the function uh, and the structure of these three elements that it starts getting interesting. So the, notice that he doesn't say the beginning and the end, he says the setup and the payoff. And the setup and payoff, you can think of in terms of <clears throat> opening a loop and closing a loop, or asking a question and answering a question. So one of, the, one of my favorite types of literature is uh, children's books. Uh, so those, those, those illustrated chapter books, uh, young, very young adult fiction. And if you look at the way they sell those, if you go to the back cover and look, they'll have like basically a three-sentence teaser for the book. It'll start out by describing the main character, you know, Junie B. Jones is your typical kindergartner. And blah, blah, blah. The second sentence will describe the predicament that she gets herself into in this book. Um, she decides she wants a fruitcake for Christmas, but when she takes a bite out of it, she realizes it's really gross. And the third sentence is the question that is going to hook the reader so they're going to want to open the book and find out what happens in the end. Will Junie throw the fruitcake in the principal's face, or will, will she tough it out and sit down and eat that fruitcake? And it's that question that gets asked in the setup that then leads to the payoff. And it, it, that's a very, very simple way of doing a setup and payoff, but you can, also, you can do it in, 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 at so many different levels that whatever is raised at the beginning gets, res, gets addressed at the end. It doesn't, it doesn't always have to be resolved. Sometimes it's left hanging on purpose. Uh, but anything that's raised in the beginning gets resolved in the end. Um, who was it? I think it was uh, Chekhov, the, uh, the playwright, who said if, you, if you're uh, going to show a gun in the first act it, of a play, it had better fire in the last act. So that's the idea of the setup and the payoff. So part of the setup is setting the stage, and we're gonna and we're gonna use basically the uh, the model of the hero's journey, which is um, you know elucidated by Joseph Campbell, and he calls it the the, the mono myth, the sing the singular story of of human development, and there. That's a little bit of an exaggeration. I think there's, there's, there's various flavors of human development stories, but certainly one of them is what's called the hero's journey. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a masculine title, um, but there's, also, there's a very feminine part to the journey as well. I would say it's fairly integrative. And just to give you the beginning, the setup of the hero's journey generally goes like this. It starts out with, the world as it is. And something in the world is not right. Something is lacking. The world is not perfect. So if, let's, if we look at sort of the, the fairy tale, there's a kingdom and there's something wrong in the kingdom. Maybe the queen is barren. Maybe there's a drought. Maybe there are dragons terrorizing the townspeople in the, the far-flung villages. Um, or maybe everything is just sort of normal and a little bit boring, right? Normal is the opposite of a story. Everything, you know, if you, so see someone, if you say to someone, tell me a story, and they say, this morning I got up and I had breakfast and I went to work and I came home and I had dinner and I watched TV and I went to bed. You're like, that's not a story. But, you know, why isn't it a story? Because it's, it's, 
nothing happens. It's normal. Uh, I forget what what comedian was it who said uh, says my kid said, um, oh I know it was, it was uh, Emo Phillips. He said I said I, I said Daddy tell me a story. He said I'm tired and I have to go to work tomorrow. I said tell me a different story. Right, so that that was the story, but it wasn't really a story. So it starts out with things being either normal, average, or slightly or grossly inadequate. There's something wrong with the world. Then you get um, the call to adventure for the hero. And the story also inter it puts the hero in the middle of this world. So whether it's the youngest princess or it's the poor tailor or it's the advisor to the king. Somebody is the central character and is not really doing anything about the problem. They're, just, they're sort of going along. And then you get what's called the call to adventure. The call to adventure is something happens in the world that, t that tells the main character, you need to step up right now. So in the fairy tale, it's the king says, um, you know, I'll give half my kingdom to the person who can cure the queen or, you know, who can wake the princess. Um, there's something specifically for the hero to do. And the call to adventure is not just, you know, go do something you've done before, go do something normal, or do something that you've been trained to do. It's always asking the hero to do something extraordinary, to do something in a way that their world will change, their life will change forever, their world will change forever. So, uh, you know, a great metaphor for that is Stephen Sondheim's musical Into the Woods, where going into the woods is a metaphor for leaving your domestic life, everything you know, everything that's safe, and heading out into the unknown where you don't know the rules anymore and you don't know what's going to be expected of you and you're scared. The next part of the hero's journey is almost inevitable. It's called refusing the call. Any hero worth their salt wants to be successful and they basically don't want things to change. So they're, you know, they're, whatever's going on, they're successful at being themselves. And so at this point, they're like, no, 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 that's not something I'm going to do. Either I won't succeed or I'm no hero, that's not for me. So think about, uh, you know, Rick in Casablanca saying, I, I stick my, my, my nose out for no man. Or think about Luke Skywalker in the first Star Wars movie, which is number four, um, where he gets this dream about rescuing Princess Leia, whom he sees from R2-D2's hologram, and then he says, now, who am I kidding? I'm just a farm boy in the, you know, the far stretches of the galaxy. That's, you know, I'm not a rescuer. That's not something that I should do. Or Harry Potter being told he's a wizard and saying, no, I'm not a wizard. Uh, you must be mistaken. I'm just a poor orphan who lives under the, in the closet under the stairs of my evil aunt and uncle and cousin's house. Right, so the refusal of the call is a very natural thing, and it's something all of us do. But then, in order for there to be a story, it, something else has to happen. And usually, in the, story, in the classic stories, it's some sort of meeting with a mentor. And it could be a literal mentor, like Luke Skywalker meets Obi-Wan Kenobi, who gives him his father's lightsaber and tells him that his father was a Jedi Knight. So traditionally, the, the, the mentor gives the, the hero a magical gift and tells them their true name. So it could be in our lives, you know, <clears throat> sitting up at 2 in the morning, eating our third pint of chubby hubby, and an infomercial comes on for, P you know, Beachbody or PX90... P90X or, uh, you know, something like that, and we go, huh, maybe this guy can help me. Maybe that person can, uh, can, can be my guide. Or 
It's a friend calling you and saying, hey, you want to join a gym? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking of joining a gym. Uh, or it's opening the newspaper and reading about the, this couch to 5K group that just joined. And so, you know, in, in, in that example, five, couch to 5K group is joining and it's near you. So the magical item is a group of people that can hold you accountable and a, and a training plan. And your true name is, I'm, I am someone who could be a runner. So that's changing the story by giving you a new identity. And once you have the meeting with the mentor, the last step in the setup process is accepting the call, is leaving the known world and going into the woods, entering this strange new world. So if you've been couch for the last 40 years and you're about to do couch to 5K, your strange new world is going to be trying to jog for 100 yards. You know, if it's someone like, uh, like Josh, whose story I'm helping with, it was weighing 420 pounds and deciding to move his body a mile a day and having to stop after a few steps, jiggle jogging and feeling the, the fat bouncing up and down on him and feeling incredibly uncomfortable and, and in pain and out of breath and embarrassed. But accepting the call, crossing into this new territory and changing the, tra the trajectory. So that's the moment at which the setup ends when the person said, okay, this is, this is now what's going to happen to me. The second part of the story is called <clears throat> The Middle Build by Sean Coyne. And it's a series of scenes that happen that we're interested in, that, that move the protagonist, that move the hero towards and away from their object of desire. So let's talk about the object of desire. In a, in a story, the object of desire is what the person wants. So in a, in, a, in a classic good versus evil story, there is the object of desire of the protagonist, the hero, and the object of desire of the antagonist, the villain. And both of them want something, and it could be the same thing. They both want the, the golden statue or... The villain, the hero wants to bring the villain to justice and the, and the villain wants to get away with it. So there, in every story there is a, an object of desire. Without an object of desire, and it could be the hero in your life, the hero wants to run a 5K. The hero wants to drop 30 pounds. The hero wants to get off their diabetes medications. Whatever it is, there's an object of desire that fuels the story. If there's no object of desire, if the hero is just like, yeah, everything's fine, no, no worries, no problems. There's nothing I need. I mean, I'll just keep doing stuff. It's all cool. That could be a very enlightened life, but it's not a story. So you need your object of desire. And the middle bit, and the, the, the setup is the, ends with the hero committing to the pursuit of their object of desire. And they might not have known that they had an object of desire before the setup, before the call to adventure. They might have had this object of desire but never felt it was possible. They might have had it but never felt they deserved it or never felt that it was worthy of, of, of achieving or it was a priority. But all of a sudden, at the end of the setup, they've committed to achieving the object of desire. The middle build is all about the hero getting closer and farther away from their object of desire. And the closer they get, the closer we get to the payoff. The payoff in a work of fiction is the hero either gets it or doesn't. But water is always a wonderful object of desire. I ran, uh, I ran uh, 31 miles over the weekend, and I, I did not hydrate quite as much as I should have. I didn't want to carry the water bottle. I went out a little bit too far. I thought of it when I, in my delirium. I thought about printing up a bunch of shirts that said "Hydration is for wimps." But, uh, be that as it may, I'm full. I'm full up now. Where was we? <clears throat> right, object of desire. So there are uh, there are stories in which the hero doesn't get their object of desire. 
Those are, you know, tragedies. You know, um, there are also stories that, that are ironic in which the hero, there's multiple objects of desire, and we can talk about wants and needs. So if the, if, if the hero at the beginning wants to become a billionaire, and but we know that if they get their billion dollars and they're not really going to change as a person, they're not going to become kinder. So if you think about, you know, Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, his, at the beginning of the story, his object of desire is to accumulate more and more and more wealth. Well, we could give it to him. Imagine if Charles Dickens, you know, had him inherit from an unknown aunt and expand his factory and become the, uh, you know, the, the, the tycoon of London and, and, and quintuple his, his income every year and have more power over more people. From his, from his perspective, he would have achieved his object of desire. But what we know as the audience, as the readers, is that his object of desire really was a compassionate heart and, and selfless sacrifice. And so the story of him getting all the money isn't nearly as interesting as the story of him getting what he needs as a human being. So you can have an object of desire like, all right, I want to run my 50K. And I do. And I'm training for it. And it's October 1st in uh, Southern Virginia. And you should come and run with me uh, or cheer me on or send me emails telling me how wonderful and brave I am for doing it. But suppose I have a terrible time on the race. Suppose I injure my foot and I can't finish. Or suppose that it's the race is called off because of bad weather, because of lightning. Or suppose my time is so bad that I don't finish and I'm, and I'm uh, you know, did not finish, DNF. Or suppose I'm running and I miss a turn and I get lost and I end up in Illinois, right? All of these things could conceivably happen. Not that I could run to Illinois, but the others. I could, you know, I could conceivably not succeed in my object of desire. Um, because, you know, my car could break down. I don't even make it there, right? So any number of things could happen that would keep me from my object of desire. But what's the internal object of desire? It's to have the the steadfastness, the courage, the stick to to train for that 50K. And I might get that. I might achieve that, the inner thing, the thing that I need, as opposed to just the external glittery thing that I want, this, um, you know, the ribbon hanging around my neck with a, with a medal on it saying that I, I completed or, you know, in my fantasy, I won the, uh, the Falls River 50K. Okay. So... The middle build is my training montage, right? It's me training for the race. It's me up one day getting a great time. It's me feeling just so terrible and not wanting to get out of bed and, you know, the ups and downs and the crisis points. And, well, I'm not going to go through the middle build in terms of hero's journey. There's lots of cool stuff in there. But uh, then you get to the payoff, and the payoff is what happens? Does the protagonist get what they want, get what they need? And that's, that's the story each of us can write about our own life. So wherever we are right now, I'm telling you, even if you can't hear it, even if you don't believe it, there is a call to adventure right now in your life. And it may have, that call to adventure may have been ringing in your ear without you paying attention to it for the last 20, 30 years, it may just have come up. But it's a call to move away from the status quo and become something more, become something greater. That is, that is our heritage as human beings, to, to transcend where we are now and become something bigger, something greater, something more. Whether it's on a physical level, like, like running the 50K, doing things we couldn't do before, whether it's on a spiritual, emotional level, um, becoming clearer about our connection to all of life, becoming more compassionate, taking risks, becoming our authentic selves, stop pleasing others, um, and, and selling ourselves out, right? Whatever, that, whatever the, our particular trajectory is, whatever our particular genius is, the part of ourselves that 
we came to this world to express, that was, uh, that was sort of packaged in our souls. There is a call to adventure for each of us at every minute. And most of us spend most of our time ignoring, or repressing, or denying that call. So this moment right now is a place where your setup can be. There are five elements, according to Sean Coyne, five, he calls them commandments of storytelling. There's five different elements, and they make up a sequence. And what he says, and I think this is true, is that the sequence can be repeated on the time, on, for the whole story on a global level, that, and the sequence can be in every single act of the story, it can be in every single scene, and it can be in every single beat, every single moment. So it's fractal that this five-part trajectory occurs every second, and it occurs throughout the course of our life at different levels. So here's what it is. Inciting incident, progressive complications, crisis, climax, resolution. Say it again. Inciting incident, progressive complications, crisis, climax, resolution. So, as I said, this is fractal. So at any moment, so we can look at that from the whole from the whole of our lives, or we can look at it right in this moment, or at any given moment, that this is the structure of how our life progresses. Now, we'll put a pin in that and come back to it in a little bit. But here's here's what we can do. Here's the takeaway for sort of story writing, story gritting our own life. So pretend you're to do this. Pretend I'm going to give you an assignment. You're back in school. You're in 10th grade English. And I'm going to give you an assignment. Um, but you, you, know, you are your age now. And I want you to write the story of the rest of your life. Like what happens to you? What's the, per, the continuing progressive complications and what's the payoff? And write one so that everything is happening just as, it, as it's happening now. Nothing changes. You continue on the same path. You keep doing the same things. You maintain the same habits. You keep the same mindsets. And, and write where that takes you. So we're the same. And you might say, well, you know, I end up, I die at the age of 84 of heart disease, um, surrounded by my family. Um, we've, you know, I've ac accumulated so much money in my life. I've uh, given to these causes. And, like, here's my obituary. Here's, how I'm, here's what I'm known for. Then write another one in which things get worse, in which your habits, uh, your daily habits devolve into something else, your mindset shifts, your faith corrodes, where you end up. So that's, that's writing the anti-novel. That's writing your descent into hell. Right? And then write another one in which things get better, in which... Here's, you know, here's how your habits change for the better. Here's how your daily uh, rituals shift. Here's how your mindset grows. Here's how your consciousness expands and what that leads to and where you end up. And look at the three endings you write for your life and decide which, which one do you want. And rationally, you would want the better one. If you don't, that's a place to start. That's a, that's a place to get curious about why you don't actually want the better one. Is it that you feel like you've got some sort of survivor's guilt that you have have unearned good luck and other people have suffered and you don't deserve the good ending? Or that you really don't believe it's possible and you don't want to face the hurt of disappointment of not getting it? Or whatever it is. But generally, most of us would want the better, the better ending. And remember, you're the writer. You get to choose. You get to choose which ending you write. And you write it with your, with your daily actions. Just as a writer doesn't sit down and pop out an 80,000 word novel in a day, they write a couple thousand words a day. If you write 2,000 words a day for a month and a half, you've got an 80,000 word novel. Right? So, Writers write by dint of daily habit, daily exercise, daily effort. And that's how we create our lives as well. 
Now, one of the things that's really powerful about this way of approaching wellness improvement is that you're not looking at things like nutrition. You're not looking at things like minutes of exercise or calories. You're not looking at any of the details. In fact, you're not looking at the means at all yet. Right now, we're just looking at what's the ending that I want. What is the payoff? What is the, the, the happy Hollywood ending of the novel of my life or the movie of my life? Okay, so write an opening scene. Write, and you know, when I say write, you can put it down on paper or you can just think about it. I think there's something very powerful about putting things down, uh, words on a screen or words on a piece of paper. But wherever you are right now, know that there is an inciting incident that's already happened or is about to happen. Something has just, and again, by inciting incident, I mean a call to adventure. So an inciting incident is something that starts, creates motion. That if everything is always the same, there's no, there's no inciting incident. You know, I got up, I had breakfast, I went to work, I came home, I had dinner, I watched TV, I went to bed. There's no inciting incident. But the inciting incident doesn't have to be you know, an asteroid from space came and was, was flying towards the Earth. The inciting incident could be, um, I went to work and I went to the snack machine at 10.30 and they were out of my favorite um, peanut butter pretzels. Right? So at that point, I had to decide whether I wanted to get the uh, Nestle Crunch or the Kit Kat or the Lay's potato chips or do something else entirely. So <clears throat> something as small as that could be your inciting incident. And believe me, those things happen all the time, every day. If you start looking for inciting incidents, you will find them because they're always looking for you. Inciting incidents are there for us to choose or ignore, but they are, they are never absent. So remember, <clears throat> what an inciting incident is, the global inciting incident for your story is it's going to move you, move the hero out of their ordinary world, and it's going to throw your life out of balance. You have to change. So if your change is, well, I'll have the Nestle's Crunch Bar instead of the um, peanut butter filled pretzels, then you've rejected the call. But if your inciting incident is there's no pretzels and you decide, well, instead of getting something from the vending machine, I'm going to go for a 10-minute walk, then all of a sudden you've, you've just changed something. You've just created a shift in your life. So, and remember, we, we resist the call. We spend a lot of time resisting the call. And this happens in just about every story because human beings crave the homeostasis. We crave sameness. We, cra we crave things not changing or things going back to normal. So usually, um, either we're pushed or we come to the edge where we have to jump, right? where, where we have to take a leap into the unknown or we're literally pushed into it by circumstances. Remember, if the hero doesn't answer the call, there's no story. If the hero doesn't have an object of desire, there's no story. Right? So at this moment, as you think about what was an inciting incident, connect with what you want. Connect with that better future, even if it feels totally fictional, even if it feels like, well, I'd love to be a Hollywood movie star, but it'll never happen. Connect with the desire. Because you never know where that desire could lead you. Maybe you'll, you know, maybe you don't have movie star looks, but you could be a podcaster. Woohoo! Right? Maybe you'll get cast. Maybe you'll become a director. Maybe your desire is to tell stories. Maybe your desire is to inspire millions of others. And so you might not get your external. You might not be the next George Clooney or Brad Pitt, but maybe you'll get the internal thing that you need that's being hinted at through this external object of desire that you've identified. Okay, so you're in your first scene. You've got some inciting incident that's happened that you, you then say, okay, this is an inciting incident. 
I thought it was just the vending machine was out of peanut butter filled pretzels, but it actually was an invitation for me to change what I'm doing, to, to shift my normal, and to, to move into a whole new reality, a whole new trajectory to achieve a whole new destiny. Now, <clears throat> you don't have to write the middle build. You just have to live it. All you have to do is move towards your object of desire, and the universe will oblige with a middle build for you. It will throw complications in your way. Remember, so we're starting with the inciting incident, those five of um, Sean Coyne's commandments of storytelling. Inciting incident. You get to choose. You get to give it significance. You're the writer. Right? Very often, inciting incidents in really good, very clever novels or movies don't look like much when they're happening. We only find out later. So, you know, I just finished a novel by uh, Neil Gaiman called The Ocean at the End of the Lane. And the inciting incident there is the main character is, is a seven-year-old boy, and he goes into the, the woods with this 11-year-old girl who's sort of supernatural, and she says, hold my hand, don't let go, because we're c confronting something. And he lets go for a second, and he steps on the ground, and he feels a, sh a, a slight pain in his bare foot, in, his, in the sole of his foot. And we don't find out till later that that was the inciting incident of the entire novel. But at the moment, at the time, it just seemed like a detail. So <clears throat> just like for you, it could be a detail, the vending machines out of uh, pre the pretzels, or you, um, you're driving home and you see a sale at the sporting goods store for running shoes, or whatever it is. That you get to decide what's your inciting incident. It could, could be something big, like you get your blood test back and your A1Cs are really elevated and your doctor wants to put you on metformin. Uh, whatever it is, you get to give the significance to the inciting incident because you're not just a hero, you're also the novelist. You're also the screenwriter. You are the storyteller. So you get to decide what constitutes an inciting incident for you. So the next thing we have after the inciting incident is the progressive complications. So the whole middle build is progressive complications, but every scene, every bit, everything you do. Okay, so you, you're driving by and you see there's running shoes on sale. So you go home and you buy the running shoes. And then you get home and you put them on and they felt really good in the store, but now they feel too tight because your feet were swelling while you were driving home. So now the question is, do you return them and give up? Do you go back to the store and replace them for a different size? Do you try to stretch them? Do you try to go running with them and, uh, and break them in? So that's, once they have a progressive complication, the next thing is the crisis. And the crisis, Sean Coyne describes, def defines as a place where you have to make a hard decision. And the hard decision is usually like the, the, the best bad decision. So if you get home and your shoes fit perfectly, that's not a crisis. But your shoes aren't fitting quite as well as they were in the store, or you get home and the box they gave you has there's two left sneakers instead of a left and a right, or one of the laces is missing, now you've got a complication. And the crisis is, what are you gonna do about it? And in every single case, you can either choose to make it a setback or a failure. Um, and I'll get into that in a second, but, but one thing I want to really highlight here, since you don't have to write the complications, they're just going to show up. The universe is going to co-write this story with you, and sometimes it'll co-write it and give you, you know, nice things, happy things, but sometimes it'll give you complications, right? We all know that life throws wrenches in the works. But when you are writing the story of your life, if you view your life as a compelling narrative towards a desired end, then you're going to view those complications as necessary plot points instead of debilitating failures. Instead, instead of things that you're going to curse and say, oh, gosh, I'm so unlucky. I can't believe this is happening to me. Why me? I'm a victim. I'm a martyr. This is terrible. When you take a writer's view of your life, you'll know that those, those complications are not only inevitable, they're actually necessary. They're necessary for your growth. If you could, if you could wish 
oh, I wish I was the President of the United States, and then all of a sudden you became the President of the United States, and you didn't have to work for it, and you didn't have to struggle for it, it wouldn't be worth anything. The, the more we want something, the more it means to us, the more progressive complications the universe is going to throw our way so that we can overcome them. It's just like going to the gym and lifting weights. If, you want, if you're good at lifting weights at a certain weight, you don't keep lifting the same weight. You try a harder weight. You try a challenge. A great work of fiction, a great narrative, increases the complications, increases the difficulty, increases the complexity, increases the danger, increases the stakes for failure. That's one of the reasons we like to keep reading. We don't all of a sudden, you know, the person's tied down on the train track, and then the next complication is their spoon is gone, and they have to use a, a fork instead of a spoon. Right? The complications have to, in a sense, get more and more challenging for us to maintain interest. And that's what life is going to throw at us. All right, so the difference between a setback and a failure, and this comes via my friend and teacher, Glenn Murphy, who is the, uh, the chief instructor at my martial arts school, ncsystema.com. And he wrote recently, um, we were doing a, uh, a Jason Bourne challenge where every day we get a mission and some exercises. And he wrote one of the, one of the overarching things about the challenge is to change our diets, to eat cleaner. And he wrote this. He says, there is a difference between a setback and a failure. If you slip up, strain a muscle, eat off plan, or get a little lazy about food prep, that's a setback. Take a minute, get your mind right, and get back on track. You only fail if you decide that your health and this journey aren't worth it, and that taking control of your health and body is impossible. So, so the crisis very often, so we, have the, we have the inciting incident, we have the progressive complication, and then we have a crisis. We have to make a decision, and it's always the best bad decision. I don't want to eat right. I want to have, I want to have the, the ice cream, but I also want to be healthy. So when we make that decision to, it's a setback, the complication is a setback, but we're going to move forward anyway, that is <clears throat> the crisis point to make that decision. The next step the five is the climax, and the climax is what we actually do. So the crisis is when we make the decision, but we may think we've made one decision. We might say, you know what, I made a decision at the end of uh, 12 miles running on Saturday that I wasn't going to run anymore. I was just too tired. I was, you know, I was a couple miles out, and it's like, oh, I just want to stop. And I had my, you know, I'm very smart. I, my brain is very good at convincing me of anything. And my brain was like, you know, you should stop now so you can train again later. You don't want to overheat yourself. It was making a, a dozen excuses a minute that were very convincing. And so that was the crisis. And at that moment, I'm like, all right, I'm done. I'm going to get to the car and be done. And but what I did instead was I kept running. And I finished the 18 miles. So the climax was actually showing that my decision during the crisis was to ignore the decision I made during the crisis. The real decision was, I'm just going to keep running. So you have the inciting incident, the complication. So maybe the inciting incident was me looking at my, you know, or feeling a cramp in my leg at mile 12, or, or feeling lightheaded. Right? So that's the inciting incident. The progressive complication is, all right, this is getting, this is getting really bad now. Um, I don't think I can make it. I don't think I can finish. It's, I'm starting to feel you know, like grandmothers pushing strollers are running past me. The crisis is, what do I do? Do I quit? That's a bad choice. Do I keep going and be, feel terrible? That's not such a good choice either. The climax is I make the choice. I decide to keep running. And then the fifth part is the resolution, which is what happens. What happens as a result of this arc? And the result is I actually had my best six miles, the last six miles. Once I decided to go, um, true, true uh, full disclosure, I, I doped. Um, my running companion, Gio, gave me a pack of goo. Oh, you got another Band-Aid for me. This was, this was a cucumber-related uh, incident. Um, so, 
gazpacho. Um, so I had a pack of goo. It had, uh, you know, sugar in it and caffeine. And, man, whether it was all in my head or whether that goo was a miracle stuff, I, I just killed it. My last six miles were, were under nine-minute miles. So that's a case there of a very, very micro example of the five. The inciting incident, progressive complications, crisis, climax, resolution. And so as a writer and as a person trying to live a healthy life, you want to expect those setbacks, which means you plan for them because you don't want to just say, hey, world, give me setbacks I'm not going to be prepared for. Think about it. What are the setbacks you're likely to achieve? And we've talked about this a lot in the past on this show. Social pressure, uh, temptation, you know, travel, anything that takes you out of your routine, all that stuff. You also want to plan to avoid them, to minimize them, and to recover from them. So what if I had stopped at 12 miles? Do I then go, oh, well, I guess I'm a failure. I'm not going to run the 50K. Maybe I should just train for the 100-yard dash instead. You know, maybe a 100-yard dash would be cool, but it's not cool for me right now. I'm looking to do distance. I'm looking to, to get these miles. I would have woken up the next day and said, okay, well, I didn't do six miles that I said I was going to do, so I'm going to add six miles today to my training or add three miles for the next two days or whatever it is to say this is a setback and I'm going to keep moving forward. It was an internal setback. It wasn't just something the world gave me. It was something that... Uh, that I faltered on the inside, but I'm still the same person moving towards that object of desire. Okay, so when you are the author of your own life, then you view setbacks as natural plot twists, and the, the harder the setback, that's actually proof of how far you've come. Because at the beginning of the story, the setbacks are small and easy, and as you, the closer you get to your goal, the harder they come and the more they call from you, the more they call from, from your soul, from your resolution, from your commitment, and from your ingenuity, and from your willingness to commit and to sacrifice for that goal. So one of the, one of the questions that any good novel asks is, what is the hero willing to give up in order to get that object of desire? What are they willing to sacrifice? And luckily, when we're going for health and wellness, the main things we have to sacrifice are comfort and ego, right? It's not like we have to sacrifice tons of money. We don't have to cut off our limbs. We don't have to um, throw our children into the volcano. We get to keep the important stuff. And when the things that we have to sacrifice are things we don't really even need in the first place. All right, so when you are the author, of your own life. That allows you to take a slightly different, um, it, it allows you to be in it in a different way. You get to be curious about things instead of taking them so personally. You get to be a bit detached. You get to take a global perspective. So, instead, so one of the, the best ways to make a decision, according to uh, Chip and Dan Heath, who wrote the book Decisive, is to ask the question, if I had a friend who was in this situation, what advice would I give them? because we give better advice to our friends than we give to ourselves. So to have that kind of 35,000-foot detachment as a writer, as the writer of our own life, allows us to make better decisions for our character, who also happens to be us. We also get to have a sense of humor about it. We can, you know, the story doesn't have to be deadly serious. It can also have some, some fun and enjoyment in it. And finally, there's less pressure because the writer can always write a shitty first draft and then make it better. And the writer can always take their first novel, throw it in a drawer, or put it in the fire, and start writing again. So as the writer, we always get another chance to make it better next time. And we're just living a life in progress, whether we're, whether we're living it or, or consciously writing it and then living it. It's always a work in progress. So uh, I don't know if there's any comments or questions on the board today. No. Amnon tells me that when, when, none, when nobody calls in or writes in, it's because I was interesting. So I, I don't know if he's just blowing smoke or if, if that's actually true. But uh, I hope this was useful. No, uh, but I, I, I've got a comment. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, when you didn't do the six and you didn't know what to do, whether you're going to go for I would mm. take ice cream. <laughs> right, so that's a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Unfortunately, well, luckily nobody was selling it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, if, if, even if I tackled another runner, all they had was water, <laughs> and water and goo. But I, have you ever taken goo? You know what this no. stuff is? It's oh. like still a little, uh, um, like a paste, and it comes in like these single packs, and you just you know you rip off the top, and you just squeeze it in your mouth, and it's kind of like basically very very bioavailable sugar and this had caffeine like I totally get doping I totally under even if I didn't want to win the Olympics or anything or become rich and famous I totally understand why you would like sh shoot up with some illegal substance to just get the feeling of of being superhuman like it's a good th it's a good thing that I'm I have no access to that stuff I wonder what it'll do for my blood sugar yeah well <laughs> I would I would say don't try it until you've run 12 miles Oh. So, no danger. Uh, so, all right. So, well, we're we're gonna we're gonna get. You. Are you exercising yet? Walking. Walking. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna work on you. We're gonna get uh, we're gonna get you to to write this the next chapter of uh, of your heroic life, and we'll uh, we'll come back and talk about it next time. So as always, I'm Howard Jacobson. This has been another Triangle Be Well TV show. If you want to know more about me, if you want coaching, I've got coaching. <laughs> My voice just broke. <laughs> I must be excited. If you want to find, if you want guidance, help, support, advice, coaching, support, did I mention that already? On your path to becoming well, trianglebewell.com. Drop me a line, Howard at trianglebewell.com. And as always, be well, my friends. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brook, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson, Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, Current Affairs with Omnon Nissan, and if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section on NissanCommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.